Good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> as you heard, my name is Mark Brackett, and I'm delighted to be here at this conference. I thought given that I'm here, actually, I live in Connecticut in the United States, but I'm actually traveling in Chicago right now. Um, I'm curious to know, in the chat, can you tell me where, you're where, where are you from today? we got Vietnam, Malaysia, London, Netherlands, Portugal. I'll be there in two weeks. Moscow, Spain, Israel, Colombia, Croatia, Ireland, working in Abu Dhabi, Germany. Wow, this is incredible. Croatia. Porto, I've been to Porto. It's one of my favorite cities. South Africa, Qatar. I'll be in Qatar in a few weeks. Romania, Croatia, Belfast. This is incredible. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, Morocco, I'm going there too. I'm very excited about that. Barcelona, love it. Um, <clears throat> well, we've got we've got the whole world in this presentation, which is fantastic. Italy, can't say enough about that. Madrid, know it well. Hungary, haven't been to yet. Gothenburg, I'm not even sure where that is exactly. Brazil, ready to go there. <laughs> All right, everybody. So welcome and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whatever time zone you're in. As you heard, my name is Mark Brackett. I am a professor at Yale. I've been at Yale now for 20 years. Um, and I've taught classes to undergraduates on personality development and specifically emotional intelligence. I'll share a little bit about that with you today. But most of my work focuses on an approach to social and emotional learning called RULER that is now in 3,000 schools across the United States and other countries. We're in 27 countries now. And um, as you just heard, I'm also uh, the author of a book called Permission to Feel, which um, has now been translated into 22 languages. Uh, many of the languages, as a matter of fact, it's being translated into Arabic. It's out already in Spanish, in Korean, uh, in Croatian, Romanian, uh, it's in Russian. So just super excited. Uh, it came out in Portuguese just last week and German. And so let's, uh, let's get going. I'm going to increase my volume. How is that? I hope that's better. By the way, if you are interested in staying in touch with me or my work, please uh, use either Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, um, and we can stay in community. I also like to start out with just giving people resources up front, because oftentimes at the end, people are like, well, where can I get this and where can I get that? And so I just figure, let me just share up front. You can take a picture of this, and that way you have it. Um, if you want free readings, you want to learn more about my book, you can go to my website, which is markbracket.com. If you're in education and want a free course on healthy emotion regulation, you can go to Coursera. If you're interested in how to apply this to adults in the business world, you can go to OG Life Lab. And if you're interested in the work that we do in schools around the world, please go to the Ruler website, okay? So I just wanted to give you all the resources up front so um, you have them uh, at your hand. The vision of the Center for Emotional Intelligence is to create a healthier and more compassionate, innovative, and productive society. So we, we choose these words really carefully, healthier, equitable, innovative, and compassionate. Think about that for a minute. Healthier? How many of you believe that the world could be a little healthier right now? A little more equity we need in our society. I know in the United States, we're really pushing for greater equity, innovation, and compassion. And so we've been living through a pandemic for nearly two years now. And what I thought would be an interesting quote is from Haruki Murakami. I'll read it to you right now. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. 
you won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain. When you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. Does that quote resonate with people? Does that, do you, do you, I'm curious, what does this quote make you think about in education right now? In the chat, would you mind sharing? What does this quote make you think about? What comes to mind? Come on, everyone. I want some active participation today. Holistic teaching after COVID time. Everything is changing. We're constantly transforming. Flexibility experiences. You know, there's a, a cliche that is, you know, with every crisis, there is an opportunity. But I do think, very sadly, COVID has been a crisis and an opportunity. You know, for example, many men, after hearing me speak, would say things like, I can't believe how vulnerable you are. You know, this feeling stuff, it's all soft skills. And all of a sudden now, people are saying things like, I need emotional intelligence training, please help me. Our college students, you know, the anxiety levels are higher than they've ever been. They're all desperately seeking strategies to help them manage emotions. Does this, does this resonate with you? How many of you had a, a moment during the pandemic when you felt like, I can't take it anymore? Did anyone have that moment? I just can't take it. And so, so many of us needed quality support and effective strategies to help us. And that's what I want to talk about today. So if you're familiar with our center's work, um, you may have heard of a tool called the Mood Meter. And this is a tool based in science that helps us to really describe our feelings. So on the x-axis, it says the word pleasantness. All of you woke up this morning, because you're here, um, and some of you were like, this is gonna be the worst day of my life. And some of you were like, oh my goodness, this is gonna be the best day of my life. Our brains are making continuous appraisals of what's going on inside of us and what's happening in the outside world. On the y-axis, it says the word energy minus five, you're feeling very low energy, plus five, you have so much energy you can't contain it. What's your energy like this afternoon, this morning, this evening? And then what we do is we cross our two axes to create our four quadrants, yellow, red, blue, and green. So I ask you right now, what color are you in today? Everyone in the chat, what's your color? Some blue, yellow, blue, yellow, pale blue, blue, green, white, red, yellow, green, blue, blue, green, blue, green, 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 yellow, green. Okay, so think about this. I'm your teacher right now, and I have a couple hundred students all of whom are feeling lots of different feelings. Does this resonate with you as a professor or as an educator in a school? Every day you're coming to work and your participants, right, your clients, your students, are having feelings that are all over the place. So the question that I've always had is, well, what do we do with all those feelings? We have feelings too, right? as the educators. So the next question is, what's your word? I'm going to ask you now to share sp the specific, precise feeling word. Three, two, one, go. Embracing, not enough time. 
Hectic. Happy. Drained. Confused. Frustrated. Angry. Interested. Active and motivated. Uncertain. Exhausted. Fine. Anxious. Motivated. Hopeful. Just tired mentally. Moving forward. Enjoyment. Okay. A lot of people are tired, overwhelmed. Some people are calm and happy. Uh, some people are optimistic and curious. So, again, I have a classroom, which is my virtual classroom right now, with students who have dozens of different emotions. By the way, one question for you. Give me a yes or a no in the chat. How many of you found it slightly difficult to find the precise word? Anyone? A ton of yeses. Everybody's saying yes. What are your hypotheses around that? All of you are in higher education or public school, private school education. My question was, how many of you found it difficult to find the precise word? And then the next question is, why? Why was it so hard? Not You're not used to being asked that question. How are you feeling? Nobody even asks it, right? It's hard to find one word. We're not just feeling one word. Living cannot be reduced to one word. You're right, but you could you could be feeling multiple feelings, that's for sure. How many feelings are you having at one time? A lot. Eight. All right, well, eight is a lot. You know, nine or more, and I'm going to rush you to the hospital. <laughs> so, right, we're, we're experiencing lots of feelings. Three, four, you know, makes a lot of sense, right? Um, eight, nine, ten at once. <clears throat> oh, my goodness, that's a lot. Some people are very complicated. Now, here we are together for an hour and a half. That's a long time to listen to somebody talk about feelings. My question for you is, what's your personal strategy? If you're irritable, tired, or hungry, or sleepy, or if you're happy, What's going to be your personal emotion regulation strategy? I want everybody to, to just take a moment and just, just breathe as Claudia is going to do and really think about their strategy. Focus, cry, pray. So some of you are saying, I'm going to take a walk, I'm going to meditate. I'm asking you today, right here, right now, during my presentation. Not what you do every, you know, if you're going to go do woodworking or take a walk during my talk, then I don't know what to say. So what is your personal strategy? Breathing, staying in the moment, focusing, drinking water. Count to ten. So let's think about that for a minute. Some of you are going to focus on my presentation or be present. A lot of you are saying, I'm going to be present. I'm going to focus. But how many of you sometimes, well, let me ask you another question. Give me a yes or no in the, in the, in the chat. How many of you at some point during my presentation will get distracted. Yeah. <clears throat> so a lot of people. So many people will get distracted. Um, and how many of you think, what well, if you have children, how many of you think if you just said to your child something like, honey, 
Daddy wants you to focus. That all of a sudden your child will focus. Or, honey, I want you to focus on what I'm talking to you about. And all of a sudden the child is focusing. Isn't it hard? I find it very, very hard to be present. When everybody tells me, be present, I'm like, you be present. <laughs> it's a lot harder than you think it is. It's just, you can't just tell someone to be present. Right? What is the mental work that has to happen in order to be present? Does this make sense to everybody? That healthy emotion regulation is, as someone just said, very hard. So everyone, this is your cheat sheet. Um, this is the inside cover of my book, Permission to Feel. Um, this is in English, but um, as I've shared, this has been translated into many, many languages, many, many languages. And you can see here, in English alone, there are a lot of words that we could use to describe how we feel. We've got the yellow, feeling lively and cheerful and energized. We've got the green, feeling calm, content, peaceful. We've got the blue, sad, bored, discouraged, lonely, hopeless. And we've got the red, feeling irritated, angry, furious. One of the goals of my work is to help people get more precise in how they talk about their feelings. Because the more precise we can get with labeling our emotions, even if it's many of them, the easier it's going to be to manage it. Does that resonate with everybody? That the better able we are to label our emotions, the easier it will be to help us manage them effectively. So another cheat sheet um, is the Mood Meter app. And um, you can download this app on uh, iTunes or Android. Um, this is the app we've had now for a couple of years. We're going to be updating it very, very soon. Um, many of you may have heard of the company Pinterest. Um, I have the pleasure of working with the founder of Pinterest and a large team there to update the app. But in the meantime, this is an app that you can use to completely unpack how you're feeling. So I wanted to give you a little bit of history of the field and the, and the work in schools. So emotional intelligence was coined or first published <clears throat> by two professors, one named Jack Mayer at the University of New Hampshire, the other named Peter Salve, professor at Yale, who's now the president. And they describe this as the ability to monitor one's own and others' emotions and feelings, to discriminate among them, and to use this information to guide one's thinking and action. Daniel Goleman wrote a book in 1995 called Emotional Intelligence that was based on that theory, but extended it a little bit more. And the work that I focus on in schools um, is typically called social and emotional learning, which is an outgrowth of both of these um, areas. Um, Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible, responsible decision-making. So you can see there was a theory that was written in an obscure paper back in 1990. Now in 2021, we have an entire field. I wanted to just share up front also that the work that I've done in schools, we've had tremendous impact. We have helped uh, reduce depression, anxiety. We've helped increase academics. We've helped teachers be more engaging and supportive. And we've helped uh, schools have less bullying uh, and more positive climates. So I share this with you because there's some there's a dilemma right now. And the dilemma is that COVID really affected people's mental health and well-being and engagement. A quarter of teens say they've lost their self-confidence during the pandemic. These are in the United States. Mental health visits to the emergency room increased by 24% for five to 11 year olds and 31% for 12 to 17 year olds. Compared to 2018, 
adults were eight times more likely to report mental distress. On college campuses, you know, where I teach, about 50%, 50% of our students are seeking treatment for mental health problems right now. There has been a 20% increase almost every year for the last eight or so years. Does this sound like people in your country, wherever you're from today? Do you see these data? Do these look familiar to you in terms of the challenge that we have with mental health, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder? What about engagement? Employee disengagement is very high. Teachers, I study teachers primarily. 46% of teachers report excessive stress. 85% of teachers say work-life imbalance is affecting their ability to teach. 30%, at least in the United States, are leaving the profession after the first five years. Does this resonate with you? That people are not sure where they want to work anymore? Even the universities are changing. You know, my university used to want people there five days a week from nine to five. But people, after having lived through COVID for two years, are saying, I don't want that anymore. I want to change. Teachers, same idea. So during the pandemic, I did some national studies. These are the feelings of children. Number one emotion, frustrated, anxiety, bored. Educators, number one emotion, anxiety. As a matter of fact, what we found in our study is that the ratio of unpleasant to pleasant emotions is 67 to 70% unpleasant to 30% or less pleasant. So anxiety seems to be rampant. Even among leaders, we're finding anxiety is the number one word. Now, about four years ago, we asked people, well, how do you want to feel? The number one emotion was happy. Today, it's appreciated. I'd like you to take a moment, please. Let's just do a little bit of centering. Can everyone get good posture in their seats? Inhale and exhale. <sighs> Bring yourself back to the moment. Breathe in and out, just slowly. Take a look at that. Appreciate it. I'm curious what you think about that word. I'm curious why. Why do you think the word appreciated came up as the number one emotion that educators want to feel during the pandemic? Take a minute and just think about that. Why do people want to feel Appreciate it. What are your top thoughts around the number one emotion that educators say they want to feel is appreciated? Because they don't feel that way now. Supports them in having better self esteem, need for connection, expected to do so much. do much more than they used to do. They want to feel recognized, put in more effort. Thank you. Great points. 
missing the emotional connection, missing the connection with others. I appreciate that. So when we go back to the mood meter, at least when we look at data in the United States, we see that we've got a lot of red and blue and just a little bit of yellow and green. And I think the question is, well, people want to feel more yellow and green. So what's the goal? Like, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to get rid of our red and blue feelings and only feel yellow and green ones? I don't know. That's a little bit difficult. And what I'm going to ask all of you to think about now is the concept, the title of my presentation, Permission to Feel. When I was writing my book, people came up to me and said, like the publishers and the, and the person who was my agent, we don't like the title that much, Permission to Feel. And I'm not sure, you know, men are going to be comfortable reading or buying a book called Permission to Feel. And I said, that's the exact reason why it's called Permission to Feel. So I ask all of you, when you think about the term Permission to Feel, what comes up for you? What does that concept make you think about? Take a good couple of minutes to just meditate on it. I'm going to get more water because my throat is getting dry. And I'd like you to, in the chat, describe what does that term bring up for you? Permission to feel. Accepting our own and other people's feelings. Nice. Looking inside, acceptance. It's okay in human professional. Not having to hold back. Why do I need it? It's a great question. Feeling free to be kind to oneself. Society views emotions as weak. Freedom. Being authentic, it's okay to be vulnerable. I appreciate that. So just a little bit about me. None of you probably know me very well because I am a uh, a psychology professor in the United States. Um, but right now I'm 52 years old. I know I don't look it, but that's because I use good skincare. Um, all kidding aside, I'm 52. Um, and I'm very happy. I have a great life. Um, I have a wonderful job. I'm married. But as a child, I had quite a lot of pain. Um, I was sadly abused as a child by one of our neighbors where I was living, growing up. That abuser shared with me, or didn't share with me, basically threatened me that if I told anyone about my experience, I would be harmed my family would be harmed. I had two parents who loved me dearly, but my mother had tremendous anxiety. And my father was always about me being more tough. Son, I want you to toughen up. Son, toughen up. And I share this with you because, and I appreciate that comment in the chat, I did suffer a lot as a child. And I was very scared and very lonely and had a lot of strong feelings like hate and disgust and anger. But they had nowhere to go. 
because the adults who were raising and teaching me did not give me the permission to feel. I had to hold the feelings inside, the fear, the anger, the sadness. And I think many of us know what that feels like. How many of you know what it feels like to not be able to express the feelings you have going on inside of you? When you can't be your true self. It's extraordinarily painful. Um, and it leads to things like eating disorders, to self-harm, to denial, to yelling and screaming with, you know, family members. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is create schools, families, universities, societies where everyone has permission to feel. Now, I was blessed in life, in addition to having a lot of pain, that I had an uncle who was a school teacher and a musician. And he happened to be writing a curriculum when he was when I was 11 years old to teach his school children about emotions. And I happened to be lucky that he would visit my family once in a while and we would sit in the backyard. And one day he asked me a very profound question. Maybe you've heard it before. He said, Mark, how are you feeling? But he said it like no one else in the world had ever, ever said it. And for whatever reason, his facial expression, his vocal tone, his body language, I decided in that moment to share everything everything and when i told him what was happening for me the abuse that was happening and the bullying that was happening he didn't say to me toughen up he said we're going to get through this together and so i have a couple of questions for you one is did you have an Uncle Marvin? Was there an adult in your life, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, an older brother, a sister, maybe even your parent, who gave you the permission to feel? That one person who you just felt you could be your true, true, true self with? Not everybody has one. The good news is that you can be your own Uncle Marvin. And I'm going to share with you now the characteristics of these Uncle Marvins. Take a look at that. Empathic, non judgmental, supportive validating, unconditional love, patient. Those look like pretty good characteristics, no? These are the characteristics of the people who give us that permission to feel, permiso para sentir. So I have something, another interesting story to tell you. After my book was released, I was doing a presentation. And I was traveling and I never spoke about my abuse or my uncle before or in any detail. 
like my story. And I happened to be telling my story in a group filled of educators. And this one man who was around 55 years old, he jumped out of his seat. And he said, are you talking about Marvin Moore, the sixth grade social studies teacher? I said, yes. And he said to me, your uncle was my uncle Marvin. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, your uncle was my teacher 45 years ago. And I'll never, ever forget his classroom. And I was shocked and I said, oh my goodness, I've never met one of my uncle's actual students. Could you please wait and let me speak with you afterwards? You're not going to believe what this man remembered about my uncle's classroom. It was mind blowing. The details he remembered about my uncle blew my mind. And so we can't underestimate the power, right, of being there, the power of giving people the permission to feel. Because there's a rich science behind this. You know, we used to think that emotions are disruptive, but they're not. All emotions are information. As a matter of fact, there's no such thing as a bad emotion. We need to move beyond the goal that happiness is the answer. You can't be happy all the time. And we know that people who strive to be happy all the time actually feel worse. It's called toxic positivity. In my research, in our center's research, we focus on five core reasons why emotions matter. Attention, memory, and learning. Decision-making. Relationships. Health and performance and creativity. So, you knew, now you know a little bit about my childhood. Well, what you, what you also could know is that I was a failing student. I couldn't concentrate in school. I couldn't focus in school. I had a terrible, terrible time learning. And for many years I thought I was not smart or I had a learning disability. But the truth was I was in fear mode most of my childhood. And when you're in fear mode, you're not in learning mode. As we know, the areas of our brain responsible for learning are the same ones that activated when we're feeling trauma. And if you're not in a supportive environment, and if you don't have the strategies to regulate, what happens? You can't focus. Does this resonate with people? That so many, so often, we blame people for having, you know, not studying or for not being able to focus when it's because of the trauma that they've experienced, that they're biologically not capable until they have an Uncle Marvin and learn some strategies. Decision making. All of our decisions are rooted in feeling. Does anyone here work with someone who is very difficult to be around? Anyone here work with someone who is just very difficult to be with? Got some yeses with triple exclamation points. And so I was married to one, yeah. It's not usually because of their general intelligence, right? Most of the time, it's because of their inability to deal with feeling. They don't regulate their emotions well. Fourth is physical and mental health. In our research, we find that organizational culture and climate 
is directly linked to how people feel each day, which is directly linked to people's mental health. Performance and creativity. Think about that for a minute. For many years, you know, I was solely focused on academics and the students who come to my university, academic performance, high test scores, high grades. Well, then why do 50% have mental health challenges? What we know from research is that there is another side to the report card. And that side is called emotional intelligence. So many people, so many college students do not achieve their dreams because they can't deal with their feelings. The frustration, the anxiety, the overwhelm, the disappointment. Does this resonate with people? That we used to think of emotional intelligence as a soft skill, but what emotional intelligence really is, is a very hard skill. So I ask all of you to take a moment and ask yourself, are you an emotion scientist or are you an emotion judge? Are you curious about emotions? Do you view all emotions as information? Do you label your feelings with precise words when you fail at regulating? How do you respond? So here's an example. During the pandemic, my mother-in-law, who is from Panama, was living with us, not because she wanted to, but because she had to, because she came to the United States from Panama for a wedding on March 1st. Go figure. Two weeks later, the entire country, the entire world nearly shut down. We thought she'd be able to go back to Panama you know, in a month or two. Nope. April, no flights to Panama. May, no flights to Panama. June, no flights to Panama. July, and so it got very tense in our home. There's a lot of animosity. It was hard to be around. And one night she looked at me because we were not getting along very well. Are you really the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence? And I looked at her and I said, not tonight. Oof. Anyone have one of those days during the pandemic where you just kind of lost it with somebody you just couldn't deal with other people because you couldn't deal with yourself am i the only one come on it was hard and that evening i had to say to myself mark actually you are the director of the center for emotional emotional intelligence um What's your strategy? Yeah, and some people were alone in that feeling of loneliness and disconnection. It was very difficult. Completely understand that. So how do we learn to be emotion scientists? And how do we avoid becoming the emotion judges? Anyone here ever work with someone or live with someone who's an emotion judge, who is critical and closed, who views emotions as, that's whatever, leave it, it's error. Tells you how you're feeling. Don't be so angry. Why are you so upset? It's either good or bad. Has a fixed mindset. My father had a fixed mindset. He would say things like, son, this is how I deal with my anger. Learn to deal with it. Okay, Dad, I guess I'll learn to deal with that in 10 years of therapy. Yes, there are people who are emotion judges for themselves. 
when you're really hard on yourself. Why are you feeling this way? Stop doing this. You're such an idiot. All that negative self-talk. It's terrible. It doesn't help. So as I said earlier, the goal from our center's approach is to try to move away from the soft skills mindset and toward more a mindset that emotions are hard skills. These are really hard skills. That means we need to change the reward system in our schools. We need to show people that these are critically important for hiring practices. And everybody needs professional development and training. So this is the next part of the presentation, which is on the skills. R-U-L-E-R. So ruler um, is the name of the five skills of emotional intelligence. It's also the name of our approach to teaching emotional intelligence in schools and other organizations. Let's go through them one by one. Recognizing emotion. <clears throat> Identifying emotion by interpreting our own thoughts and physiology, as well as other people's facial expressions, vocal tones, body language, and behavior. Think about that for a minute. Being self-aware. How am I feeling? How are you feeling? What's going on from my body, what's out of my mind? What am I observing in your face, in your body, in your voice, in your, in your voice, in your behavior? We're going to try it. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Can you all see me a little bit bigger now? Hello. Okay. I am going to display an emotion. And I'm going to ask all of you to type the emotion into the chat. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, let's look at this. Scared, lonely, fine, strange, sad, happy, fear, detached, calm, apathetic, lonely, no emotion, fuzzy, scared, no emotion. <clears throat> Talk to the hand. Scared, I don't know. <clears throat> so. What does this exercise teach us about perceiving emotions? We project different interpretations that we need training. It's really hard. We're guessing all the time. It's very subjective. Yeah, let's think about this for a minute. We're in work. We're at home all the time. We look at our kid at dinner. We look at our students at the university or at the school. We look at our colleagues. And we're, aren't we making automatic judgments all the time? And that's telling us how to behave to someone. We all oh, that person, they have a chip on their shoulder. This person, you know, oh, he, he's Mark's in a bad mood today. I'm not going to approach him because think about it. I'm your friend. I'm your colleague. I'm at work. I'm showing these different emotions. <clears throat> You're coming in to see me. And you immediately say, oh, look, Mark's happy. to. Oh, let me approach him to talk to him and tell him some good news. Oh, no, Mark looks like he's in a bad mood. Mark looks irritable, annoyed. Oh, I'm going to stay away from him. But what's the one problem? What's the problem with that?
What is the problem with that? Everyone, you have become an emotion. You have become an emotion judge, not the scientist. Do you see how fast we all become emotion judges? Now, there are many factors involved in emotion perception. First, most emotions are subtle. Second, the question is, you know, are you reading people or are you attributing emotion to them? How we feel, culture, racism. There are many, many things that can interfere with us being accurate in terms of understanding how people feel. The good news is that you could learn this stuff. You could become more aware. You can ask more questions. You could become an Uncle Marvin and ask people, how are you feeling? Think about that for a minute. You know, one of my goals here is to get all these thousands of people and hundreds of people across Europe and other countries to become emotion scientists, right? The next skill is understanding emotion. Knowing the causes and the contextual influences of emotions, as well as the consequences on thinking, learning, decisions, and behavior. Think about that for a minute. Our emotions are constructed based on our life experiences. There are probably global themes. Anger is about injustice, disappointment <clears throat> about unmet expectations, anxiety about uncertainty. But what I perceive and what you perceive as an injustice can be completely different. Labeling emotions, having and using a nuanced vocabulary to describe the full range of emotions. So here's your big quiz. I'm going to give you all two minutes on your own to just think about this. Don't cheat and look it up in Google. Take two minutes to think about it. What's the difference among anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, and overwhelm. You've got two minutes. I'm going to get more water because you're making me, you're making my throat dry. You got two minutes. What's the difference among anxiety, stress, pressure, fear, and overwhelm? And to my friends over at ICERI, I'm going to try to get a volunteer to come on camera if possible to share the difference in two minutes. Everyone think about it. Okay. So do you think it's po um do you think it's possible is there one person who says I got it. I feel confident. Who feels super confident that they've got this down? Give me a yes in the chat if you said I know the difference. I'm confident. And if you're willing to come on stage with me, to meet me in person, to have a conversation for a minute. Definitely not you, Mitzi. <laughs> Anyone? They're all related. Maybe the duration. Lots of different things going on. They're all psychological. All right, 
I'm just going to tell you. Here is the answers. Anxiety. Uncertainty. Stress. Too many demands. Not enough resources. Pressure. Something at stake is dependent upon my behavior. Fear. Impending danger. Overwhelmed. Overcome by emotion. What do you think? Are they the same or are they different? What do you think? Same or different? They're different. And so the more able we are to label these feelings accurately, the better we're going to be at managing them. Here's an example. Like many of you, I am a college university professor. So back, I guess, eight years ago, I was going up for tenure to be a full professor. And I was really not feeling well. I went to the doctor. I had heartburn. I was, my back was hurting. I was, I couldn't sleep. And I labeled my feeling stress. So I went to the doctor and within five minutes, he said, Here's your medication for your heartburn, and here's your medication for your anxiety. And I said, that's it? Yeah, you'll be fine. This is what happens to everybody when they go up for tenure. And I was like, are you kidding me? That doesn't, like, I'm not really thrilled with that response. Anyhow, I decided to take a nice long walk after that to really check in with how I was feeling. And I realized I wasn't anxious. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't under too much pressure. I didn't have fear. I was just chronically overwhelmed. Chronically overwhelmed. I had too much on my plate and I was just exhausted. I never said no. And I appreciate uh, Christina saying that in my native language, there's no translation for overwhelm. Stress and pressure almost mean the same. And just like in English, there's no word for sympathetic joy. There's a beautiful word in Sanskrit, mudita. Mudita, M-U-D-I-T-A. And so we can have these feelings, but not have the language to describe them. The better we are at labeling those feelings, the easier it's going to be to know what to do with those feelings. And there aren't negative emotions. Remember, there's no such thing as a bad emotion. But what we want to be able to do, especially with these unpleasant ones, is label them properly so that we can get the support that we need. Because everybody's doing mindfulness now. Everybody's doing yoga now. Everybody thinks yoga is the answer. Mindfulness is the answer. It's helpful, but if you're chronically overwhelmed, adding mindfulness to your day is going to make you more overwhelmed because you need space to do nothing. Here's a good example. Among Yale undergraduates, they all said they were stressed. Every one of them, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. I made them write about the things that make them stressed. And what we uncovered was the number one real emotion was envy, E-N-V-Y. All of the things that my students said they were stressed about were about social comparisons. So what, what, why is that important? It's important because knowing that they were feeling envy was a pathway towards helping them and managing their emotions. Does this resonate with people? That the more granular and specific we can get with our experiences, right? the more we can figure out what to do with it. I just said this, but language is critical, right? We have language as professors, as scientists, right? For research, we have language for statistical analyses, correlations, and 
factor analysis and all this stuff. But where do we teach the language to be self-aware? Expressing emotion. Knowing how and when to express emotions with different people, across different contexts, right? including how personality and gender and power and social norms and race and ethnicity and culture all interact with it. Think about that. In many of our organizations, people of greater power, they can express whatever they want. People of lesser power have to be more careful. In the United States, I can say that as a white male, I can express anger more freely than a black male can. There are many rules. I've been to many of the countries, you know, that are present today. For example, I was in Croatia with my colleague who is Croatian. And I would say, hello, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. And I, the response was not what I expected. My immediate brain was people are different here. People are not friendly here. That was the emotion judge coming out. The emotion scientist says, interesting, people's response to my greetings are different here. Let me learn what that means. So what I learned was that I was saying, hello, people, and people were looking at me weirdly because I was just keeping, I was moving, I was taking a walk. And so my friend who's Croatian said, Mark, people are thinking you're the weirdo because you're saying hello and then you're not pausing to actually have a conversation. They're thinking that they might know you and that you want to have a conversation. You're just walking away. Do you see what I'm getting at? Critically important. Yep. Emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence inextricably linked. So certain people have the privilege to express certain emotions. The people who don't have that privilege, it impacts their health and wellness. And we have to just be mindful that our way is not the right way. Can everyone please read this quote by the well-known psychologist, Viktor Frankl? Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and freedom. What do you think about that? How does that quote resonate with you? How many of you feel like you could use a little bit more space So many of us are reactive, right? We get triggered and we go right for it. We don't pause and take a breath. So emotion regulation has to do with the thoughts and the actions that we use to prevent unwanted emotions, reduce ones that are difficult, initiate, maintain, enhance our own those emotions in order to promote well-being, build positive relationships, and attain goals. And we have what we call the big seven. It starts with permission to feel. Then we have to learn how to manage our physiology, manage our bodies, getting enough sleep and eating healthy and exercising, managing our thought processes, managing our self-talk, feeling heard and being appreciated, getting connected, helping others to regulate theirs, 
managing life smartly by doing the things we enjoy. All helpful strategies. You know, one of the things that we found during COVID was that the leaders' emotional intelligence mattered tremendously for the culture and climate of a school. And that leaders with higher emotional intelligence were in schools where fewer teachers wanted to leave their jobs. So we cannot underestimate the power of emotional intelligence. I'm going to end my presentation by just sharing with you a little bit of the work that we do in the school systems around the world. So RULER is our systemic approach. It's not a rule, it's not an assembly, um, it's not classroom kits, it's a systemic model. This is our theory of change, which is complicated, and you can you know, read this later in one of the articles or in my book. But essentially, we're trying to shift people's mindsets, deepen people's skills, focus on the culture and climate, and make sure that our policies align with the principles of emotional intelligence. And so we start getting people ready, and then we do staff development, student and families, and then sustainability innovation. And it looks like this from a perspective of implementation. Always adult professional development first, then students all the way from early childhood to high school, families outside of school. We have online modules to train people in all the skills, like in the mood meter and the five skills of ruler. Early childhood, they're learning language for emotions, strategies on how to regulate emotions through different units. High school and middle school, project-based learning, helping students create a vision for their high school career. And then there are these tools. We call the charter our tool for building a positive emotional climate. Instead of saying, I want rules in my classroom, we say, well, how do you want to feel in our building, in our classroom? Spirited, united, respected, determined. You can reward children for being emotionally intelligent leaders as opposed to just their academics. Then there's that mood meter to help build the skills. All the R-U-L-E-R -E skills, from language to understanding how the brain operates within each quadrant, to showing that this works in many cultures, as I said, 22 languages, that's Hebrew, Chinese we're working in. Working with children who have learning differences to help them build their awareness. Artwork. These are schools in Mexico where they have Ruler Day, which is so cool. You can see El Medidor Emocional, Como Te Sientes. We have a tool we call the Meta Moment, which helps people build awareness to be their best selves. I love this, this child. My best self is kind, hardworking, selfless, determined. That's pretty freaking impressive. They can draw out their best selves. Tools to resolve conflict and to build better perspective taking skills. To restore classrooms once there's been a big fight. So let me end by saying a few last things. In my belief, we have to move away from quick fix models and focus on theories of change, lasting results, better implementation, long-term thinking. We need to think more like prevention scientists. If we don't have more intervention, there will not be fewer cases moving forward. We need to really evaluate our policies at the government level, at the classroom level, to make sure that we're not harming children. In America, 19 states still allow for corporal punishment. It's unacceptable. 
So I have a project that I'm working on in my home state, which is Connecticut. Um, ruler is in 50% of all schools in the state of Connecticut. And it's a lot due in part to building relationships with all the different key stakeholders across the state, right? You got to bring, get the army involved, get the leaders involved. When you train everyone in emotional intelligence, that's when transformation can happen. So I'm going to put this all together and then we're going to, I'm reserving a good 15 minutes for questions. All right, everybody. It starts with permission to feel. You got to give yourself that permission to feel. That means that all emotions are information. There's no such thing as a bad emotion. We got to strive to be the emotion scientists and not the emotion judges. We're going to work to refine these skills. Yes. We're going to refine these skills. Appreciate that developing emotional intelligence can be very hard and accept it. It's very freeing when you just accept the fact that this is hard work. I think we have to focus on systemic change at country level, government level, classroom level, home level. And I just want to end by saying this is such important work that's oftentimes pushed to the side when in fact it should be front and center. And my hope, given that now I've spoken to people across many different countries, is that we can all work together to create an emotion revolution, literally, so that every child develops the skills they need to navigate their lives. And I think importantly, if we're going to make sure that every child develops the skills of emotional intelligence from preschool to high school to university, what that means is that we, the adults who are raising and educating children, that we have to be the best possible role models for them, which means that we have to develop the skills first. And on that note, I just want to thank you for your time and energy.